Thank you for joining us today for the Nursing Grand Round Program. My name is Victoria Lancy, the Education Program Manager for Michigan Center for Rural Health, and I will be facilitating today's program. This program is jointly provided by the Michigan Center for Rural Health in cooperation with Michigan State University College of Nursing. This program will provide nursing continuing education today. Please remember to keep your mic muted until the Q&A component at the end of at the end of the program. Please remember to mute your mic after you have asked your question so the signal is clear. Handouts are located on our website at www.mcrh.msu.edu. Under the education link on your left, then under the nursing link, and then under today's date, which is March 3rd. Attendance forms need to be filled out and signed by hand. Don't forget that you are required to complete the attendance form and email, fax, or mail it back to our office and then complete the evaluation form online via SurveyMonkey. Certificates not, will not be sent unless both the attendance form and evaluation have been completed. We are asking you to complete and return, return these forms to the MCRH office within two weeks or by March 17th. Certificates will be emailed out and usually take six to eight weeks to receive. The speaker and planning committee did <laughs> indicate that there are no conflict of interest for this program and no commercial support was provided. At this time, I am pleased to present Ann Carl, who is a certified wound ostomy nurse at McLaren Greater Lansing, who will be speaking on wound care essentials. Go ahead. Thank you and hello and welcome. I just want to give you a little bit about me. I am a bachelor prepared nurse with a specialty certification in wound and ostomy from the Wound Ostomy and Continence Nurses Certification Board. I am, uh, have been a, in this position for 10 years and have experience in wound ostomy nursing specialty working in the acute care setting. I am currently pursuing a master's in science in nursing with a focus in nursing education. And thank you for attending and let's get started. So our, our objectives today are to describe the essential elements of a focused wound care assessment and documentation standards. Um, we will discuss wound characteristics uh, for differentiation of wound type and identify evidence-based practice treatment modalities. Um, we'll also uh, talk about resources for patient education and follow-up care. So a little background, um, chronic wounds are present in about 2% of the United States population. On average, 6.5 million Americans have chronic wounds. Over 2 million of these Americans will suffer with a venous ulcer in their lifetime. Diabetes, increased age, obesity, and other factors all contribute to the rising number of chronic wound cases. Diabetes affects 8% of the total United States population and estimated 25 million people and 26% of Americans that are over the age of 65. The incidence of chronic wounds, especially foot ulcers, increases among those diagnosed with diabetes. Patients with diabetes are about 10 times more likely to require an amputation at some point in their lives. Each year, approximately 700,000 diabetics will undergo an amputation. The cost of this care is high. Chronic wound care costs the United States approximately $50 billion dollars annually. So the first slide here talks about skin and skin is the largest organ of the human body and sometimes as um, nurses we forget that it's an organ and that it needs to be assessed just like the heart and lungs. The average adult has approximately 3,000 square inches of skin. One third of the circulating blood volume is used by the skin and the skin varies in thickness from 0.5 millimeters to 6 millimeters. And skin is the only organ constantly exposed to the changing environment. Human skin is divided into two primary layers, the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, and the dermis, which is the innermost layer. The epidermis is avascular and regenerates every 26 to 42 days. The dermis is the thickest layer of the tissue <coughs> And on the slide, you can see all the internal structures that are contained in the dermis. Because the dermis constitutes about 90% of the skin's thickness, it is truly the bridge between the epidermis and the underlying muscle and bone. 
The major functions of the skin are protection, immunity, thermal regulation, sensation, metabolism, and communication. Maintaining skin integrity is a complex process, and without appropriate interventions, damage from surgical incisions, injuries, burns, and pressure can lead to debilitating or life-threatening consequences. Risk factors for common wounds. Numerous factors negatively affect wound healing. As you can see on this slide, there are <coughs> numerous things that um, influence this. Increased age, <coughs> presence of infection, poor nutrition status, immunocompromised, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, systemic illness, smoking, and high stress all contribute to the delay in wound healing. Holistic wound assessment. Look at the whole patient, not the hole in the patient. A lot of times when patients have wounds, we're just concentrating on the wound itself, but sometimes we need to look at the whole, the whole picture. And that includes obtaining a patient history, family, social, and medical, um, looking at comorbidities that that patient may have. So if they have an ulceration on their foot, for instance, are we looking to see, was this caused by diabetes? Have they ever had a, a screening? We're looking at current drugs. Um, do they use alcohol? Do they smoke? Prescription medications. Uh, what is the history of the wound? When did it start? Um, has it been larger or smaller? Is there a history of complications such as bone infection, which is osteomyelitis, or any kind of past treatments that have worked or not have worked? Uh, patient knowledge of the disease process is really important because a lot of times patients don't know um, how to care for their wound. They do what they've heard or what someone else has told them to do, and a lot of times they don't understand what's causing the wound. So knowledge of disease process is important to assess with the patient. Current treatment regimens, what are they doing at home? Do they regularly visit someone to take care of their wound, like a wound clinic, or do they have a home care nurse? Um, and we're also looking at nutrition status, because without good nutrition, the wounds are not going to heal. So six steps to wound evaluation. So when you're evaluating a wound, we're looking at where is it located. Um, is it located on the left trochanter, for instance, or the ischium or the medial mal malleolus? We're going to measure the wound, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the next slide. Um, looking at color, uh, is the wound bed, are they sh does it show a different color? Like, is it red or black or pink or gray? That always gives a little bit of an indication what's going on. Um, the tissue type, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Can I mute? Just a second, everybody. Hold on a second. Sorry, everybody, I have a real bad cold, so I may need to stop for coughing. <laughs> um, anyway, going, moving on, um, I, we're always looking at exudate and whether or not there's odor in the wound. Also edema, signs of infection, such as um, changes in the wound bed, those are subtle indicators that something else needs to be done. We're looking at the peri-wound skin to make sure that it remains intact, otherwise the dressing will, or the wound will get a lot bigger. <coughs> Sorry. Um, also another thing is this to evaluate pain. So for wound measurement, uh, when you're measuring a wound, there's a couple of different things to know. Linear wound measurements are length and width, and then we're always measuring depth. Skin thickness is 0.1 millimeters, and most documentation requires a depth. And if there is not a break in the skin, just record zero. Um, wounds should be measured weekly or if there is a change in the wound appearance. 
probing, you know, sometimes we don't realize that there's something else going on underneath there. And so when we're doing our assessment, we always have to kind of take a swab and probe because um, a lot of times the wound will show you that there are things called undermining or tunneling. And um, for undermining, you would use the clock face, which you see on this slide, to describe, um, for instance, under step two there, where the swab is inserted and the undermining is outlined. So to describe that, you would describe it as being approximately two centimeters of undermining from the nine o'clock position to the one o'clock position. And in the case study one, um, this was an interesting case. Uh, the physician had done an assessment and asked me to come by and look at the patient. And um, according to his note, there were two openings and they were very small, um, like 0 0.3 uh, centimeters. And when I did my assessment, I probed the, both of these openings, and this is what I found, which is multiple tunnels in multiple different directions. So it's always important to make sure that you're knowing exactly what's going on in that wound bed. So a lot of um, different <coughs> facilities use wound photography um, to document wounds that are present on admission or that are present when the patient is admitted to the facility. Um, just a few words on that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but taking pictures, you know, it's a common practice and you notice everybody has a camera today. So just knowing how to be compliant and what the standard of care is, I'm just going to go over a few points. Um, first of all, with a camera, you need to have the camera readily available at the point of care. So whoever's doing that initial assessment needs to have that camera. Cell phones are not usually used because of a HIPAA violation because cell phones cannot make sure that that patient's wound picture is secure. Now, some EMRs now offer um, uh, software to make your cell phone compliant. So you'll notice some physicians have that and they'll use their cell phones. An important thing to remember is that when you're taking a picture, you need to have a consistent tool to measure the wound. So you can't just use whatever and, you know, say that this is okay to use in this, this one and we're going to use something different in the next one. The reason why is because you're comparing measurements over time. And to have it placed into a, a chart and not have a consistent measuring tool, then it makes it really hard if there's ever any questions about that wound. One consistent measuring tool that I included on this slide are concentrical circles that you can place over the wounds that at no matter what camera angle, they're going to show the same exact measurement. And um, they work really well because you can always have that same circle over that wound then. Um, software needs to be available to the end user and be you know, uh, able to use with the charting system, whatever charting system that is. Um, patient privacy is paramount when you're taking pictures, so you never want to take pictures of any distinguishing features um, or of the patient's face or the family that might be in the room. Uh, policy should be in, in place for using photography and documentation of wounds. Recognizing infection. Um, there's three, four different levels of infection here on this slide, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. Contamination is the first one. This is where bacteria are present in the wound bed but aren't causing any tissue damage or a delay in healing. Um, a lot of chronic wounds have bacteria. Do all chronic wounds need to be treated for bacteria? Not necessarily. Um, if they're non-replicating organisms that are living on the surface of the wound, a lot of times the wound will still heal. Um, these patients live with these wounds for a long, long time, and they can, you know, if you swab the wound, it's going to grow bacteria. Sometimes it will grow skin flora bacteria. And then, you know, if we're treating that with an antibiotic aggressively, a lot of times it makes those uh, bacteria resistant. So um, the next level is colonization, and this is where the wound has bacteria that are growing on it consistently. Um, that aren't usually just taken washed off with cleansing. The bacteria have invaded the tissue a little bit, uh, but they're really not affecting the host. So the host is not showing any signs of, you know, chronic infection or acute infection in that wound. And a lot of times, um, if you use advanced wound care and good wound care practices, um, colonization can be aborted. Um, critical colonization is where the bacteria start to invade the host. This is where you're going to notice the erythema, 
and you're going to notice that the wounds the wound is changing maybe it's putting out more exudate maybe it is <clears throat> excuse me giving the patient more pain um and then of course where it goes to a full, full blown infection is where it really starts to affect the host systemically and this is where you might notice cellulitis and sepsis differentiation of wound type so there are a lot of different wound types um, according to research done in 2012, the distribution of wounds and ulcer types is depicted in the picture that you see on your screen. Um, <clears throat> let me take a break for it. Sorry. Non-healing surgical wounds represent the largest category there, as you see. Um, and then the other wound type is uh, traumatic wounds. But over half of the wounds that are listed on that um, chart are chronic wounds. So that compromises uh, venous ulcers, pressure ulcers, um, diabetic foot ulcers. So as you can see, trauma, or trauma and surgical wounds are a little bit different um, of a category as the chronic wounds. Pressure ulcers. <clears throat> Pressure ulcers are a significant health concern for patients. Uh, 2.5 million people um, are treated for pressure ulcers each year. More than 1 million people develop pressure ulcers every year in the U.S. Um, this contributes to increased health care costs. Uh, one full thickness pressure ulcer treatment can range from $43,500 to $70,000. The total cost in the U.S. is about $11 billion annually. So that original figure that I had talked to you about uh, at 50 billion for treatment of chronic wounds, um, so 11 billion of that 50 billion is just for pressure ulcers. And the prevalence in the different settings, um, I have some new figures on that. Prevalence is defined by the Wound Ostomy and Continence Nurses Association as the number of patients who have at least one pressure ulcer at a given point in time. So for instance, long-term care, um, the recent evidence shows that in long-term care, the prevalence of pressure ulcers is about 27.3%, with about 8.5% of them being facility acquired. In home care, it ranges anywhere from 3% to 10% um, of you know, pressure ulcers that, that home care nurses are dealing with. And then in acute care, it's about 11.9% of pressure ulcers in the facility at any given time, and then about 5% that are constitute facility acquired pressure ulcers. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about pressure ulcer staging. The National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel is a multidisciplinary group of healthcare professionals who focus their attention on education, public policy, and research related to pressure ulcers. And they have defined the, the pressure ulcer stages as follows, and this is from 2009. Um, a stage one is uh, intact skin with non-blanchable redness in, in a localized area over a bony prominence. Darkly pigmented skin may not have visible blanching, but the color may be different from surrounding areas. The area may be painful, firm, soft, or warmer, sometimes cooler than the, ad the adjacent tissue. Stage 1s are difficult to detect in people with darker skin care tones, so we need to be um, more aware of the other subtle changes. <clears throat> Stage 2 um, are partial thickness, loss of the dermis, represented as a shallow ulcer with a pink wound bed without slough. Um, it may also represent an intact or open or ruptured serum-filled blister over a bony prominence. Your stage three is a full thickness tissue loss. Subcutaneous fat may be visible without bone, tendon, or muscle. Slough sometimes is present but does not dis obscure the depth of the tissue. There may also be undermining or tunneling. A stage four is a full thickness tissue loss with exposed bone, tendon, or muscle. Slough and eschar may be present on some parts of the wound bed. Often the undermine, there is undermining and tunneling. <clears throat> stage four pressure ulcers vary um, by atomic, anatomical location. Um, they tend to extend into the muscle or supporting st structures such as fascia, tendon, or joint capsules making osteomyelitis um, possible. Exposed bone and tendon is visible or directly palpable. The other two categories are unstageable and deep tissue injury. 
An unstageable pressure ulcer is a full thickness tissue loss with a base of the ulcer that's covered by slough, which can be yellow, tan, gray, green, or brown, or eschar, which can be brown or black. In the picture that you see on your screen, that is an ulcer that has, it is covered by eschar with slough at the edges. Without debriding that ulcer, they would not know how deep it is to stage it accordingly. Suspected deep tissue injury is a purple or maroon lesion located uh, um, <clears throat> in an area of discolored intact skin or a blood-filled blister due to damage of the underlying tissue from pressure, friction, or shear. And as you see in the picture, um, it looks like a very opaque purple lesion right on the heel. So checking for pressure ulcers um, is important uh, when doing an assessment to check for pressure ulcers. And the, <clears throat> the most common area is the sacrum, with the heels being the second most common area. But as you see on your slide, there are lots of areas to check. Some uncommon areas are behind the ears. Um, that, those happen from oxygen tubing. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll see one on the bridge of the nose from a BiPAP mask. So looking underneath um, devices is really important as well. Pressure ulcer prevention. Nurses should always focus attention on pressure ulcer prevention. Since this type of wound is often preventable and can be partially due to external factors, nurses need to <clears throat> be especially attentive to prevent ulcers from forming. At the cellular level, tissue ischemia results from pressure and the lack of blood flow to that area. So I included a picture on the slide showing how the um, pressure ulcer develops when it's uh, bony prominence against a mattress. At the cellular level, the um, capillary bed is compressed and damaged and does not let uh, adequate blood flow go to that area. And that's what starts the pressure <coughs> ulcer for, to form. The tissue closest to the bone are usually damaged first due to the constant pressure between the bony prominence and the surface. The first sign of a pressure ulcer is a small area of non-blanchable erythema. Um, non-blanchable erythema must always be fully investigated to rule out in further tissue damage. Internal risk factors for the development of pressure ulcers include uh, reduced mobility or immobility, sensory impairment, acute illness, decreased or impaired level of consciousness, extremes of age, um, so you're very young and you're very old. Uh, presence of diabetes or vascular disease. Presence of severe chronic or terminal illnesses. Uh, previous history of pressure damage. That always uh, puts the patient at higher risk. Malnutrition and dehydration. External risk factors include pressure, shearing, which is moving across the surface, um, Friction, which is constantly rubbing on the surface. Um, sometimes you'll see this uh, pressure ulcer from friction when patients are kind of pushing their heels into the bed. Moisture, medications, the ultra level of consciousness. So this is the Braden scale. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Braden. Um, nurses play a key role in eliminating or reducing the external risk factors that may influence the degree of internal risk factors. Most facilities have prevention protocols in place, which nurses, uh, nursing is expected to follow. Pressure ulcers account for increased length of stay, morbidity, and mortality. Um, treatment requires valuable nursing time, so attention to skin assessment and prevention of pressure ulcers is paramount. The Braden Scale assists nurses with varied experience and judgment to consistently identify patients that are at risk for skin breakdown and the formation of pressure ulcers. When used correctly, the Braden Scale reminds busy nursing staff to attend to this aspect of patient assessment and care with consistency necessary to influence positive outcomes. Consistent use of this identification tool will directly <coughs> will direct the attention of the nurse to six specific factors so preventative care can be appropriately prescribed. Interventional protocols include or coincide with the level of risk and must be implemented to prevent pressure ulcers from forming. So using the Braden scale, um, there are interventions that can be done. So for instance, if the patient has a score that um, indicates that they have issues with mobility, those are things that you would want to address. 
So vascular wounds. Um, not all wounds are pressure ulcers. And so I'm just going to cover a few different wound types so that we can uh, differentiate between what is a vascular wound, a diabetic wound, and pressure. So um, lower extremity venous disease, also re um, referred to as chronic venous insufficiency, accounts for about 70% of all ulcers on the extremities. Um, lower extremity venous disease, uh, to recognize this, you will see things um, such as variscosities, uh, scarring, edema. Uh, the hemosiderin staining is where blood has um, gotten caught between uh, tissue space and the heme of the blood discolors the skin, which you can see in the picture on your slide. Um, also, you'll notice with vascular wounds that there's uh, an element of eczema or dermatitis, and sometimes um, you will also see chronic erythema. Um, the normal ankle brachial pressure index is usually about one or higher with venous disease. Um, the ankle brachial pressure index is a test that they use to determine uh, what the blood flow is in the, in the limb itself. So diagnosis uh, for lower extremity venous disease includes clinical examination and um, an ankle brachial pressure index. In the treatment, uh, the gold standard for treatment is compression. So um, a lot of times folks, these folks will have wound care treatments uh, accompanied by a degree of compression. Um, one thing that you might be familiar with is an unaboot. Another thing is um, sometimes they'll wear stockings that are compression that compress the tissue as well. The other type of vascular wound is um, an arterial ulcer. And uh, smoking is the number one risk factor for the development of peripheral artery disease. Uh, persons who smoke have a two to five fold increase for developing peripheral artery disease. <clears throat> this is often more extensive in patients that have diabetes because diabetes causes calcification of the small vessels. And then um, if they're smokers with diabetes, they will have a much greater risk for peripheral artery disease. Um, arterial ulcer characteristics include uh, the smooth, shiny skin. You'll notice on these folks, they have um, skin that doesn't have much hair. Um, sometimes you'll notice thickened toenails. Um, they may be, have uh, limbs that are cold all the time. Uh, they might have absent or diminished pulse, pulses. And the ABI um, pressure, the ankle brachial pressure index will be abnormal. And uh, other things that you'll, you'll see with the ulcerations on uh, patients with arterial disease, the edges are usually really well defined. So it's like a perfect circle on their leg. Um, you'll notice maybe gangrene or dark spots on their toes. They might have a pale wound bed because there's not much blood flow there. Um, minimal drainage, a uh, lot of pain. Um, these people have a lot of pain with these wounds. And uh, clinical diagnosis is usually done by an arterial Doppler or an arterial gram uh, just to see what kind of flow they have in that limb. Management, uh, we don't usually, the standard of care is not to take off stable SHR. So for instance, if you had a patient that had um, a, a arterial ulcer on their heel, you would not debride that unless it was infected because if they don't have enough <coughs> blood flow, that wound will never heal and it could possibly um, predispose them to an amputation. Another wound type is skin tears. Um, a skin tear is a traumatic wound occurring principally on the extremities um, is a result of friction and or shearing forces which separate the dermis from the epidermis and um, the underlying structures. Uh, a skin tear um, is classified into three different categories and I put three pictures up here to show you those categories. Category one is um, without loss of tissue. So that skin flap can be reapproximated, and um, the, the wound usually heals just fine. The level or the category two is a skin tear with partial um, tissue loss. Um, as you see, the picture in the middle shows partial tissue loss. The flap doesn't always doesn't come over the whole total area, so there's a little bit of skin open there. Um, category three is a full tissue loss. It's complete loss of tissue, so the flap is totally tore off. Um, treatment for skin tears is usually according to how much 
skin is lost and you want to um, control bleeding and reapproximate re the tissue flap if possible. The best method includes using steri strips and a non-adherent dressing such as Vaseline gauze or a soft silicone foam dressing and or, and or telfa pads. You just don't want stuff to stick to that. The skin will regenerate. However, if it sticks, it's just going to keep tearing. Um, film dressings should be avoided because they adhere to the surface and when upon removal may tear the skin further. Another wound type is um, the neuropathic ulcer or the diabetic foot ulcer. And I've included three different pictures here that we'll talk about in, in a minute. According to the Centers of Disease Control, um, in 2015, diabetes is a significant health disparity for our country. According to the CDC, diabetic neuropathy with ulcers causes 50 to 70 percent of all non-traumatic amputations in the United States. So caring for these folks is a really big deal. Um, a lot of times, uh, the patients don't realize how, uh, how bad their ulcer can be if they don't take care of it. Um, a, when I do patient teaching, I really explain to them what this can mean for them in the future. Uh, I, I hate to do a horror story, but a lot of times um, patients really need to know. They need to know what's going to happen if they don't take care of their foot ulcer. 50% uh, of amputations are due to diabetic neuropathy. So patients that have no feeling, um, that's a huge complication for them. And they need to be taught not to run barefoot and to have someone check their feet. A lot of times, um, because they can't feel, they'll end up with a foreign body embedded into their foot. Um, diabetic neuropathy usually presents with palpable pulses. Uh, they do have diminished sensation. Um, pain may be absent or decreased. Uh, you might notice that the patient has structural deformities, like the picture in the middle is a picture of a patient with developing um, condition called Charcot foot. In Charcot foot is where the bones remodel and they cause what's called a rocker foot. And then they get an ulcer right in the middle of the sole of the foot. Um, the wounds usually present with even wound margins. Uh, they may have a callus rim. As you notice, the picture on the left has a callus rim. That's typical of a diabetic foot ulcer. Um, sometimes these folks will have an acute cellulitis and they'll have osteomyelitis uh, because the wounds are really deep. Uh, if most of the time when I go to see a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer, um, I get my swab out and a lot of times they probe to the bone. Lots of times they look like round punched out lesions. As you see, they're pretty um, consistent across the board. Uh, <clears throat> tunneling may be present and sometimes you'll notice blistering. So this slide um, is a mnemonic on how to look at wounds, and I still use this even though I've been in it for 10 years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so the MEASURE acronym is a tool used to think through wound care. <coughs> Excuse me. So for instance, when you look at the wound, you want to look at, you know, what caused the wound, and you want to mis minimize the trauma to the wound so there's no more damage. You want to eliminate dead space, um, such as tunneling and undermining. Uh, you want to assess and manage the amount of exudate. So for instance, if there's a lot of exudate, you want a dressing that's a lot more absorbative, and if there's not so much, you might need to add moisture. Supporting the body's tissue defense system is looking at factors such as nutrition, and um, like shoes, if they're a diabetic foot ulcer, that kind of thing. Um, always use non-toxic wound cleansers, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Remove infection, debris, and necrotic tissue. Um, look at your environmental maintenance. Is the wound bed moist? Because wounds only really heal with moisture. So if the wound bed's too dry, like I said, you may want to add moisture. Also, um, look at your surrounding tissue because you want to protect that from injury. So what should I document? Um, that's always a question that a lot of people ask. Uh, what needs to be documented? Um, the biggest thing that you that you can document you can never document too much on a wound. 
If you think it needs to be documented, then document it. Um, just remember to include in your note how the patient reacted to the procedure that you're trying on them, if pain medication was given, because that's really important. Um, when you, you know, document, if you document uh, on assessment, you're documenting those wound measurements. And then when you're going back and doing a reassessment, you're documenting whether or not there's a change in the wound. Each patient should be um, screened for pressure ulcer risk. Um, use critical thinking, uh, you know, to look at your comorbid conditions, uh, especially when you're using Braden as your screening tool, just so that you're not missing something. Um, regularly reviewing the patient's care plan and being sure that pressure ulcer prevention is included is important. Uh, document if the patient is refusing any of the treatment plan. Uh, if the patient uh, refuses treatment and it's not documented, then there's no supporting evidence there that we couldn't have done something more. So making, just making sure that whatever you're teaching that patient, any kind of follow-up care, that it's all put in the documentation, and then that way we're covering every base. So general principles for wound management. So the, the very important um, principle, the very first thing you need to think about is controlling or eliminating that cause. So is it pressure? Is it friction? Um, is it, you know, uh, a diabetic patient that has impaired, <coughs> a, a, a impaired uh, feeling? Is there a circulatory impairment? Uh, whatever's causing that wound needs to be addressed or, or else the patient will end up having more wounds. Um, the second thing to think about is providing that systemic support. So are we managing edema? Are we managing um, the nutrition status of the patient? Um, are we controlling systemic conditions like, let's say, uh, high glucose levels um, that are contributing to that patient getting an infection? Number three is to maintain your physiological local wound environment. So preventing and managing infection, um, making sure the wound is cleansed and clean of, you know, debris is removed, removing non-viable tissue if that is the case, um, maintaining appropriate moisture, Eliminating, eliminating your dead space, controlling odor for the patient, eliminating pain if you can or minimizing it at the very least in protecting that surrounding tissue like we talked about earlier. Um, management is the fourth thing, just making sure that the patient is managed uh, beyond when we're seeing the patient. Do they need a referral to the wound clinic? Do they need home care services so they can take care of themselves? Do they need even other outpatient things that maybe, you know, uh, are contributing to the reason why they have the wound. So wound cleansing. So when we're cleaning a wound, a lot of people ask me about, um, you know, why does the wound need to be cleaned? Well, the wound needs to be cleaned because a lot of times there are bacteria that live on the wound. Uh, patients ask me this all the time. Well, the wound drains so much, why do I need to clean it? Well, just making sure that those organisms are removed is really important. And for our patients, soap and water is fine. There have been a lot of clinical trials that have been done that say soap and water is fine to clean chronic wounds. Um, in the hospitals and um, long-term care settings in outpatient clinics, saline is usually the preferred cleanser. And uh, as you see, uh, optimal pressure between 5 and 15 PSI will effectively remove anything in the wound bed. Antiseptics are not regularly used to clean wounds because most antiseptics are cytotoxic to new tissue. And so um, wound antiseptics should be used in only certain situations. So some topical treatments include um, enzymatic debridement. This is an ointment that is used on a wound that might have slough or really soft um, eschar. And it works by breaking the fibrous bonds that are on that wound of, with that dead tissue, and it continually breaks those bonds and cleans that wound um, off of the dead tissue. It's an enzyme called collagenase, and it's derived from the fermentation of an organism called Clostridium histolocytium, if I'm saying that right. This treatment is um, put on daily under moisture retentive dressing, and uh, the heat of the body works to activate the collagenase, so the collagenase will break the bonds. Um, it's usually well tolerated by patients, and it works very well to keep the wounds clean. Hydrogel, um, that is a wound, uh, a wound treatment that is 90% moisture. So if your wound is dry and you put a hydrogel on it, you're going to moisturize that wound. The gel is usually cooling to the wound and less painful for the patient, and it does not ad adhere to the wound bed. Hydrogels are also available in a silver formation. 
for um, wounds that are infected. Oh. Sylvadine cream is something that you will see used in chronic wound care, but it's really made for bur burns. Um, the FDA has really only approved it for burns, but you um, will see it used from time to time on certain types of wounds. So there's a lot of different dressing types. Um, as you see, there's <clears throat> these are advanced wound care dressings. Let's just talk about gauze for a minute. So gauze is um, common. You guys, I'm sure everyone here sees gauze on a regular basis used on wounds. Uh, gauze is really not the standard of care for chronic wounds. Gauze is considered to be a non-selective form of debridement, and oftentimes um, the patient's wound will dry and the gauze will adhere to the wound bed and cause the patient significant pain. And when it's removed, um, it will remove good tissue along with the bad tissue. So it's considered non-selective. Um, gauze in the healthcare setting constitutes for a lot of nursing time because um, the dressings have to be changed very often so that they don't become attached to the patient. So all the other dressings on the slide are considered um, advanced wound care. Um, the hydrocolloid dressing is uh, a dressing that's made of a material called caria, and caria um, is uh, really a moisture retentive dressing, and these dressings are um, used on a lot of things from pressure ulcers to all sorts of different types of wounds. Hydrofiber is a really absorptive fiber. As you see in the picture, it absorbs and turns into a gel. Um, so what, with your wound drainage, it will absorb a lot of drainage. Usually it absorbs... Um, a, I think it's six times its weight, and so it, it really becomes a really moist dressing and works really well for highly exudating wounds. Alginate is also some, very similar to a hydrofiber. It also absorbs a lot of fluid and becomes more gelatinous. Um, foam dressings are used for wounds that are highly exudating as well. It just de depends on where that wound is located and um, what kind of foam dressing that you want to use. Um, foam dressings have borders and they, they also come without borders. Uh, film dressings, you, you'll see those used uh, to protect bony prominences and things like that. And then there's combination dressings that use different components of, um, they may have a hydrocolloid border on them and have a foam in the inside and those are considered combination dressings. So packing a wound. So the purpose to, pa to packing a wound is to maintain the internal tissue structure, allowing the wound to heal from the bottom up. Without packing, the wound can heal prematurely and allow abscess formation. Uh, without packing, you'll also see wound edges that it will roll in. And once the wound edges roll in and attach to the underlying wound tissue, um, the wound will never heal. It will only reach a certain stage, and without being debrided, um, it having that wound edge taken off, uh, will it ever be able to form epithelial tissue and actually heal? So there's different types of packing material. Gauze, you'll see, sometimes you'll see gauze packed in wounds. Um, gauze rolls, uh, they come in various sizes. Uh, the gauze is basically used just to, in, you know, inside that wound bed to help that internal structure. They also have, um, Ribbons that are gauze, ribbons that are a denser woven material um, that you can use for packing. There's also that hydrofiber ribbon that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, techniques are clean and sterile, and um, most chronic wounds require just an aseptic technique um, using uh, sterile supplies and uh, not a sterile setting like you would have in a hospital. Um, sterile settings in the hospital are used usually when they are going and doing wound care on internal spaces, like an organ space, for instance. Um, with your hydrofiber dressing, you will want to fold your dressing when you're packing it. You don't want to pack it down hard like you would um, the, like the denser woven uh, gauze ribbon, because when that hydrofiber dressing is packed into the wound bed, it will expand. Another type of wound treatment is negative pressure wound therapy. Um, this type of treatment is used um, to promote granulation tissue by forming a negative pressure environment. It uses um, a type of material down in the wound itself. Sometimes it's gauze, sometimes it's a sponge. And then um, usually that is covered with a drape, uh, which is kind of like, um, for the lack of a better word, like saran wrap that goes over the wound that has an um, adherent seal. 
and then a suction disc is placed over an opening in that drape and hooked up to a pump that creates the negative pressure. Um, the negative pressure applies um, equal pressure to the wound bed and helps the wound close. Um, it removes interstitial fluid and infectious material. It provides that closed wound environment and helps it to heal. And usually it's about a third of the time, depending on patient factors, uh, for that wound to heal. So negative pressure is worth considering if the wound is deep enough um, to have that type of a dressing. So I created a basic algorithm um, on this slide so that um, you could follow this to choose the appropriate kind of dressing. And I put a few on here. Obviously, there's hundreds of dressing types. And so um, I just put the basic ones that I talked about on the other slides. So if you look at the algorithm, your first step would be to cleanse. And then you would want um, to look at that patient. Uh, is the patient infected? Um, and if so, the infection needs to be treated. Um, and then debride, uh, do they need to be debrided? And uh, <clears throat> then as you work your way down the algorithm, you can see that choices are based on whether the dressing is, or whether the wound is dry, moist, or wet. <coughs> so for instance, the patient has a moist wound and you want a dressing that you could leave on for anywhere from four days to a week. Um, choosing a hydrofiber and then maybe covering it with a foam would be a good choice. <coughs> Excuse me. So patient teaching. So things to, you know, be aware of when you're um, just giving the patient general information is addressing hygiene, um, looking, you know, having them look at their wound and know what to look for, um, using aseptic uh, technique so that they're not contaminating their wound, making sure they're using fresh supplies um, and not using reusing supplies that they, they think that they need to reuse. And then, you know, making sure that they understand how important follow-up care is. And then I included a little blurb on how to um, look at the, you know, instruct the patient for surgical site incisions. Uh, a lot of times patients think that they need to clean those vigorously, um, and that's usually not the standard of care. <coughs> so no scrubbing, no rubbing, um, and, you know, not removing tape strips, no lotions or powders. Uh, taking a bath is usually not recommended with a surgical incision. And um, exposing the incision to sunlight, uh, the scar will turn dark. Um, and then, you know, making sure that the doctor is also giving them the information that they need to take care of their incision. So discharge planning. Uh, includes good follow-up care. Just making sure that the patient understands uh, the importance of follow-up care is just so, so important. Uh, a lot of times patients don't think that they need to do anything for follow-up because the wound isn't that big and it will usually just heal on its own, but a lot of times that's not true. Our patients are sicker than ever and comorbidities really add an extra component to wound care. Um, home care can be an option for some patients. Wound clinics are um, a place where the, the patient is going to be seen by a, a board-certified physician. So sometimes it's really important to get that patient that referral to that wound clinic. Uh, physician follow-up. A lot of times physicians um, don't have a lot of knowledge about wound care. So if you're seeing a patient that's been seeing their doctor and then you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, this isn't right, it might be time to call that doctor and say, would you mind if I refer that patient to a wound clinic? Uh, giving the patients really good instructions on how to care for their wound uh, when they're going from your care to their home is really important. And a lot of times we have to just make sure that those instructions are written at a really basic level so they understand what they need to do. So here's a list of patient resources that I included. Um, your local wound clinics, podiatry, dermatology, and plastic surgeons always usually have um, physicians that have more education on this type of care. Um, other places are these online uh, places that I listed on your, on your slide. Um, the WOCN, uh, there is lots of information there. The American Academy for Wound Care is the AAWC, and they have so much information for patients. So you can go there and print out stuff to hand them. And they have patient care information for home care. They have information for, um, for long-term care and for 
uh, professionals as well. And the American um, Board of Wound Management has uh, some information for patients, and so does the um, National Academy for Wound Care. If you want more education, um, there's a list here for professional education websites where you can get more education on wound care and you can get more concentration. So if you wanted to learn more about diabetic foot ulcers, for instance, um, there's lots of CEUs on all of these websites that go into even more detail than I did today. So I'm on, I have a few minutes left to do a couple case studies. Um, so this first case study is Mr. P, and Mr. P um, comes to you with a leg ulcer. And he is a 79-year-old patient that has um, uh, congestive heart failure. If you're doing the wound assessment, you notice that his wound is moist, uh, that it's light to moderate exudate, um, that there is no odor in the wound itself. Um, the wound bed is pink and granular, so it looks like it's healing. The wound measures 3.2 centimeters by 3 centimeters. Uh, by 0 0.2 centimeters. We always want to measure in centimeters for consistency's sake. Um, he reports that there's no fever or increased pain at the site. His diet is well balanced and he eats well. He wears support stockings at home. So a dressing type for Mr. P, um, thinking about all of these factors, um, would be based on the amount of exudate. Uh, a good choice would be like a hydrofiber um, over that opening. Uh, covered with an occlusive border dressing, such as a foam border dressing. Changes could be every few days to a week, depending on the healthcare setting. This is the second case study. Um, this is a pressure ulcer case study. So Mrs. Mrs. B is admitted to the hospital after a fall in her home. Um, she has uh, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, osteoporosis, multi-infarct dementia in the early stages. She's 75 years old, and she's 4'11 and weighs 90 pounds. She's alert, oriented to, to place and people, but has a difficulty with time. She's ambulatory but unsteady. She uses a walker when she remembers to. Um, she can use the toilet with assistance. Her appetite is poor, and she feeds herself. She takes water poorly, but likes sweets and juice. She sits in the chair most of the time when, home, when at home and is able to shift her weight slightly on her own. So based on this information, <clears throat> the things that stand out for pressure ulcer development are her age. She's 75 years old. She, she's at a higher risk. Um, she, she weighs 90 pounds, so she may be a little bit bony in some areas. Um, her activity level is uh, pretty pretty slim so she's you know she's probably not as mobile as she could be um, she may have an issue with incontinence because she can use the toilet with assistance but um, she's unsteady using her walker so she may not make it there she may also have a lot of, some nutrition deficiencies since she has a poor appetite and she likes sweet and, and juice so I would imagine that her um, blood sugars may be high as well because she has diabetes so is she at risk? Absolutely. Um, a score, if you were to use the Braden scale, a score would be right around 16. So you would want to address um, the activity issue and the mobility issue. Perhaps um, get her cushion for her wheelchair or wherever she's sitting at home so that she's not um, having so much pressure on her bottom. Uh, making sure that she has um, incontinence care items if she needs them. Uh, addressing her nutrition status. Uh, maybe she may need meals on wheels or something like that to, you know, uh, make sure that she has things available for her. Maybe even something to increase her appetite a little bit. Uh, so these are all things that would be looked at um, if we were using the Braden scale to avoid pressure ulcer development. So thank you so much for having me today. And um, I now have time for some questions. We will open the lines now for questions, and also we are beginning to plan for future grand round, nursing grand rounds, so if you have a topic that you would like offered, please indicate that on your evaluation. We will now take questions. Please remember to state your site name first and then ask your question. Are there any audio sites that have any questions or comments? This is Kevin Keene, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Uh, very good presentation. Thank you. Sorry for the coughing. 
That's are okay. There, are there any other questions or comments for any other audio sites? This is the Area Agency on Aging site. Um, I have a question regarding the healing of wounds. Okay. Um, just a moment while I figure out this phone. Speakerphone. Okay, I think we've got it back. Okay, so when you have a, say, a stage four wound that's healing um, and you no longer have um, tendon or muscle or bone visible, do you go back on the staging as you're assessing the wound or does it continue to be a stage four also right up until it's healed? It is, uh, you always um, continue with the stage uh, because you never want to reverse stage. There's multiple reasons why you don't want to do that. The first reason is, is that let's say that there's no longer tendon, muscle, or bone visible, and you now stage it as a stage two or a three, and then that opens back up to tendon, muscle, and bone. Then that puts whoever's providing that person's health care at risk for litigation. So you always want to keep the same stage all the way until that patient's wound is healed. Another thing to consider is the patient history. So when I have a patient come into the hospital and the patient says, I had a stage four pressure ulcer on my coccyx and I'm doing the skin exam, I'm going to write that, that that patient had a stage four on their coccyx. That way, if that wound was ever to open up, because scar tissue only has 80% of tinsel strength, that's really a high area for reopening. So you're really protecting yourself by just making sure that you document patient, you know, has a healed stage four coccyx ulcer. Does that make sense? Great, thank you. So when, when it's in the process of healing, you document it as the original stage, but note what you see. That's correct. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other audio sites that have any questions or comments? Thank you. Okay. Are there any video sites that have any questions or comments? Yes, this is uh, Northeast Michigan Community Mental Health in Roger City. And I just had a quick question about packing of the wound. If you're packing a wound with gauze, does that, does that need to be a wet gauze to prevent it from, you know, taking away any new tissue that grows in when, when that's changed out? Or how does, are you concerned about that? Yes. If the wound doesn't have a lot of moisture, you would pack it with, with moist gauze. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. And it was a great presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other video sites that have any questions or comments? Or are there any other audio sites that have any questions or comments? Okay. If there are, if you can't think of any, if you can't think of any questions or comments now, or if you think of them later, please feel free to either send them to me directly or indicate them on your evaluation, and I will pass them along to Anne, our speaker here. Um, Thank you for joining us today and everybody have a great day.